not quite like simply hanging a painting, is it? Hi everyone and welcome back in my studio. If you're new here, my name is Adar and I make marble sculptures. In this video, I'm going to share with you the long process that eventually led me to make this work. But before getting to the actual making of the work, I'm going to first tell you a little bit about the context in which the work was created and the ideas behind it. I'm also going to share a little bit of the aesthetic history, if you want, of the work. And after that, I will finally get to the part where I share all the stages required for making this work from beginning to end, explaining all the tools and techniques that I applied. But first, let me tell you why I made this work. The idea started while I was doing some research for my PhD project. The research focused on the relationship between sculpture and violence. And while I was doing some reading on the topic of violence, I came across a famous line by Karl von Clausewitz. Clausewitz was a Prussian general and military theorist of the early 19th century. He wrote an influential treatise on war and military strategy. The book is called Vom Krieg, which translates as On War. In this book, he declared that war is an act of violence to impose your will against your enemy. And the most famous quote from this book is his definition of war, namely, war is a mere continuation of politics by other means. The original German sentence goes, Der Krieg ist eine bloße Fortsetzung der Politik mit anderen Mitteln. Forgive my pronunciation. War is a mere continuation of politics by other means. But it seems that the situation is beginning to change now. War, with its internal logic, special mentality, principle and priorities, is beginning to penetrate the fabric of global politics with a great intensity. Clausewitz's formula is beginning to work in reverse, with politics being the continuation of war by other means. As a matter of fact, the 1967 book Report from Iron Mountain goes a step further and claims that we are constantly living in a state of war and that peace is the continuation of war by other means. This was later also pointed out by the philosopher Hannah Arendt. But as Aristotle said, man is a political animal. And consequently, I claim that everything that we do is a continuation of politics. The way we dress, what we eat, the jobs that we have, the gender we relate to, the team that we support, whether we want it or not, whether we're conscious of it or not, everything is an inevitable political statement. And now arriving to the content of this video, I would claim that even art, or perhaps especially art, is a continuation of politics by other means. Let's not forget that art has always been at the service of politics and nationalist agendas. Look at the classical biennials and expos, for example, where different pavilions represent different countries, each competing with one another to present themselves as the best, a kind of intellectual and cultural war, if you want. Or look at the art market that regularly focuses on and promotes a specific group of artists that represents a national, cultural or ethnical identity. There is a very insightful documentary online that exposes how during the Cold War, American abstract expressionists were backed by American government offices as a way to counter the rich Soviet cultural scene. So without going too deep into this discussion, I just wanted to say that I think that art is yet another tool for expressing a political thought. And this is why I took Clausewitz's sentence and removed the word war. By the way, remember Michelangelo's definition of sculpture. Sculpture is that which is done by means of removal. So again, I took Clausewitz's sentence and removed the word war, leaving the rest. A continuation of politics by other means. By the way, in the original idea, I also had the text by other means, but then I decided to remove it and I'll tell you why in a bit. I didn't substitute the word war with art because I wanted to stress that everything that we do is a continuation of politics. Also, by leaving out the word art, this work becomes self-referential. It's not anymore about external issues. The work itself becomes a continuation of politics. The labor required to make it becomes a continuation of politics. Its statement becomes a continuation of politics. And even its display, whether by a gallery, a museum, an institution, or a collector, becomes politics. By the way, since we're talking about politics, I must address a misunderstanding for which many people have been confronting me. 
You see, apparently everyone associates this letter type to Nazi Germany. This letter type is called Fraktur, which is a subcategory of older Gothic letters. And the question that I got asked most is why would I carve something in a Nazi typeface? But this couldn't be further than the truth. You see, the Nazis thought that the Jews had introduced Gothic letters in Germany, and they even called it Juden letter, Jewish letters. So in 1941, Hitler himself banned this letter type, and the Nazis forbid its use and replaced it with a more classical Antiqua letter type. By the way, there is no evidence of any connection between the Jewish people and the Gothic letter type. I chose this letter type because it was the font used in the first edition of Clausewitz's treatise on war. But at the same time, my choice was also guided by a desire to expose one of the many fallacies of our perception of reality and history. Now, that was the theoretical background of the work. And now, before getting to the actual carving, let me tell you a little bit about the genesis of this work, because it wasn't an easy path, and I had to change and adapt the work due to some unexpected troubles and shifts of mind. So for this work, I had chosen to carve the text in a stone that is called Belgian blue, not to be confused with the homonymous breed of super cows. Belgian blue stone is a sedimentary stone that is quarried in the south of Belgium. When left unpolished, the stone has a gray bluish tone, hence the name Belgian blue, while when polished, the stone achieves this beautiful dark tone that is closer to black. The stone has a hardness of about two and a half or three on the scale of Mohs, so it's basically as hard as marble, but it's full of fossils, as you can see in this close-up. And these fossils at times make it challenging to carve small details as they tend to chip off easily. This work originally started as a larger inscription on a big singular slab. This is how it looked at the beginning. But then I realized that I had made the stupidest mistake ever. There was a spelling mistake. And there is no excuse for making such a stupid blunder. But you must know that I had decided to carve the sentence in its original language, German, which I don't speak. And German is very close to Dutch, which I do speak. And this word here is correct in its Dutch spelling, but in the German language, it requires another N here at its end. So in Dutch, we say andere, and in German, they say anderen. And before transferring the text onto the stone, I double-checked every single word, letter by letter. But the subtle difference in the spelling of this word in the two languages apparently tricked my mind and slipped through my eyes. In any case, now that I was aware of the spelling mistake, I had two choices. Either redo the whole thing or adapt. And I am a big believer that adaptation is a key to survival, progress, and evolution. Remember Charles Darwin's lesson, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one that is most adaptable to change. So my adaptation in this case entailed to cut out each word and then recarve the misspelled word. Moreover, guided by the general attitude to try to see the positive in what at first sight might seem negative, I then realized that cutting out each word was not a loss. In fact, the separate words would allow for a more flexible display of the work. Depending on where the work would be exhibited, the words could be displayed one next to another forming a long line or one on top of another, centered, aligned, justified, shuffled, or scattered all around the place. So you can see how all these possibilities contributed to an enriched dimension of the work. So armed with an angle grinder, I ruthlessly started dismembering the monumental slab. each word was separated, I could get back to carving out the letters. But while carving each individual word, I kept thinking about the work, and I realized that some of the words were in fact superfluous. You see, one of the most important guiding principles of stone carving is to remove anything that is redundant. So I realized that for the message that I wanted to convey, that everything is a continuation of politics, I didn't need the second part of the sentence. So I decided to leave out the part that said by other means and reduce the sentence to 
a continuation of politics. Short, powerful, and to the point. And this is the state in which the work lives now. So now that you heard about the general concept behind the work and its history, let's finally move on to its making. Unfortunately, I don't have good quality footage of the first stages of the work as I started making this work almost two years ago when I still wasn't making vlogs. But basically I had the slab industrially pre-cut to speed up the process. And then I roughly cut the outlines of each letter with the angle grinder. After this initial roughing out, it was time to get more detailed. I transferred the words onto the stone by using a stencil that was previously cut out using a laser cutter. And the first step consisted in cutting inside and around the letters with a small grinding disc attached to my flex straight grinder. The disc has a diameter of 10 cm and its cutting edge is diamond coated. It does a very good job at cutting effortlessly into the stone, just like a hot knife cutting into butter. For the carving, I didn't use a large variation of chisels, basically only five. A large five flat tooth chisel with a cutting edge of 25 mm wide, a smaller five flat tooth chisel with a cutting edge of 10 mm, a flat chisel 10 mm wide, a small round hole of four millimeters, and an even smaller flat chisel of three millimeters. I first used the large flat chisel to roughly cut around the letters and getting close to their edge. Then to go a bit more aggressively into the size of the letters, I used the small round hole. I find that the small size allowed me to remove stone in a more controlled way than if using a larger chisel. It's a bit counterintuitive, but this has probably to do with the fact that the small chisel transmits the energy from the pneumatic hammer to the stone in a more efficient way. Also, the small cutting edge of the chisel concentrates the vibration onto a smaller surface, thus making it less likely that the vibration expands to a larger section of the stone, eventually breaking it. Once the rough cutting of the sides of the letters was done, I went back at it with a flat chisel to put a bit of order in the previous mess. With this chisel, I also defined the bottom edge of the letters. Since each segment was derived from the larger slab that I showed you previously, their size was not consistent. So in between carvings, if the weather was good, I would go out and cut the slabs to the same height. To flatten out the surface around the letters, I used a large tooth chisel. The surface was actually already flat, but it had these ugly marks left behind by the industrial cutting machine and I wanted to put a nicer texture to it. I particularly love the texture left behind by the tooth chisels as it reminds me of the cross-hatching technique that is particularly dear to me when drawing. But I thought that this texture was a bit too rough. Also, as this tool chisel was too wide, I couldn't reach inside and around the letters. A general harmony was necessary, so I went back over it with a smaller tooth chisel with finer teeth. The small tooth chisel easily allowed me to achieve a constant texture both around and inside the letters. To open up the tiny gaps between the letters, I used a Dremel with a small burr. The typical marks of the tooth chisel were a nice contrast to the surface of the letters themselves, as I was going to leave these smooth and eventually polish them to a dark color. But you'll see that later when I show you the final result. The last chisel that I used was this very small flat chisel which allowed me to carve the sharp edges at the inside of the letters and at fine intersections. One of the most challenging things was to carve the sharp 90 degree angle between the flat surface and the sides of the letter. After struggling with this for a while, I resorted again to the straight grinder in combination with a cylindrical diamond coated burr. It was a dusty business, but hey, dust is the stone carver's inevitable curse. This was very effective in creating that straight vertical edge without damaging the outlines of the letter. The operation required a steady hand, and its use was risky at times, but at the end the tool enabled me to achieve some pretty spectacular details. Check out this very thin detail that is 2 cm in height, but only 3 mm in width. But the problem with the cylinder burr is that it didn't leave a nice surface behind. 
neither on the side of the letter nor on the flat surface. So I had to clean that up. I went back to the fine tooth chisel for the flat surface while the sides of the letter had to be cleaned by hand with a diamond coated file. This is not a paid promotion, but a shout out to the Italian company Renzo Milani that makes great tool for stone carving, such as this fine diamond file. Once the carving was finished, it was time to polish the upper surface of the letters. For this operation, I used my angle grinder on a Velcro fitted sanding disc attached to a rigid bed. I gradually worked my way up with sanding paper of various grits, starting from 120 up to 600. You can see how each finer sandpaper progressively brought out the deep dark color of the stone, giving it a subtle glossy effect, thus creating a strong contrast with the matte background that made the letters really jump out. And after many days of cutting, carving, grinding, sanding, polishing, here we are with the finished work. This is just a temporary setup. I made this only for this video. I'm going now to put it back onto the wall and hopefully you'll be able to see it soon somewhere in a gallery, a museum, or even better, perhaps a public space. And now before closing, I'd like to take a minute to thank you for watching this video all the way through the end. I hope you enjoyed watching the genesis of this work as well as learning about the concept behind it. If you like this video, feel free to click on the like button and subscribe to my channel and thus indirectly support me in making more of these videos. Thanks for watching. My name is Adar and I'll see you next time.